So, when I was 20, I wrote what is loosely termed pornography. Well, and I was once really embarrassed to find that my mum had read it, but I'd be terrified. I'm not terrified, but I really want all my kids to read it. Yeah. Right. So you've written a lot of stuff. Oh, filthy stuff, yeah. About yourself and about other stuff. And yes. What, how do you feel about your kids either sitting down to read it or having somebody else say, ooh, look at what your mum wrote? Well, there's two things. First of all, given that it's something like 94% of teenage kids uh, in Western culture tend to get their sexual education from pornography, right. I, uh, particularly for women and for young girls, want to write about sex in a way that's not so much fingers down the throat, choky, bum spanky, kind of being bummed across the landing looking uh, by someone who looks like Burt Reynolds, and to write about sex in a way that's funny and accessible and truthful and it's about humanity and connection and the ridiculousness of the whole thing. Uh, so, you know, I'm on a mission from God there. Or at least my own from vagina. God. From God. When they, you know, just go, it's a line from the Blues Brothers where they justify okay. justify blowing up hundreds of police cars by going, I want a mission from God, but they're right. not. Uh, so on one hand, I want a mission from God and for feminism. And on the other hand, the safest place to put some information that you don't want your children to read is in a book written by you. I can <laughs> absolutely promise you my children have never read a single word that I've written. Are you sure? You don't want to read about your mum having a wank. That is 101. I think that, you know, you can you can Google that. Right, but okay. That a fact. Yeah, but then you don't, so you don't want your, you don't want, you, they don't want their friends telling them that they've read about their mum having a wank. Well, the thing is, I don't know if you've gone out and met the young people and the youths, but they're like really right on and, you know, sort of woke and all this kind of stuff. And all their friends, it turns out, are sort of strong feminists and fans of mine, which of course makes it even more agonising for my children that their fa- that their friends will be asking me for an autograph. Or one of them did a uh, school essay on me last year and did a whole display with pictures of me that they'd drawn. Um, I was a question in my daughter's A-level. Really? Mm. Uh, Be that. Um, I'm a question in the in GCSE and A-levels as well. So. Are you? Yeah. Okay, but as I can dance the monkey. Yet? I can dance the monkey. As you to set that, yeah. Well, my, my children are younger than you, so, than okay. yours, so because I'm young still. You're, you're, you're still quite old. You just showed me your boss pass, so I'm, yeah, 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 I'm yeah. on age, yeah. distance from the grave, I'm winning so far. Now, my daughter, yeah. who's 24 next week, uh, she's about to her first TV programme. Feminist Prank Show. Wow, okay. Channel 4, called Riot Girls. Okay, okay, how does the Feminist Prank Show work? Is it telling girls that they're equal and that they won't be judged for their appearance or their voices or their choices or the way they express their emotions and they go, ha ha ha, no, we were it's taken a <laughs> feminist... It's not like that at all, the patriarchy's still here. No, it's taken a little bit of that. It's taken a feminist point and going out and doing something funny with it, mainly with men. Yeah. But not just... So, for example, she goes on the tube and tapes around men who are manspreading and uh, stuff like that. But yes. three Ps that she seems to be as obsessed about as you are. Yes. Porn, periods, pubes. Yes. Right. Well, they're the first three problems that you... So at the point where you turn from a child, which is still sort of generally unisex, you're all climbing up the same trees and wearing roughly the same kind of trousers, to the point where you become a woman, those are the first three things that tell you that you're changing from a child into a woman. And they're all massive problems. Uh, you know, you start growing pubes... Uh, that's uh, not seen as a great thing in our culture. Immediately, basically, immediately, that's quite reasonable, immediately something goes quite wrong. Yes, exactly, which is why I write about it. I mean, my day, no one was ever going to see what And is that because of porn? Yes, I believe so. Uh, I can't think of any other reason why you'd have it other than for cinematography. It just allows you to see more, more man sausage going into the lady cave. Uh, so, so immediately you've got a problem. Uh, as, you know, the first thing that happens when you become a woman... Just let me stop you there. Have you used that line before? What, lady sausage in a man cave? Mm. No. So the first thing that alerts you to the fact that you're now becoming an adult woman is a massive problem. You've suddenly got all this hair here. You look like kind of Mr. Tumnus all in, in one kind of area. Um, so, so the pubes you, come before the period? Usually, yes. Uh, so, so that's the first problem. Then you've got to deal with that. Uh, you're not going to go to your parents and go, I now have a massive epilation problem. So then you have to suddenly turn into some kind of burglary. Do your daughters house. come to you? Oh, well, I obviously sat my children down and was like, right, let's have the conversation about hair. We can talk about what is natural, and we can talk about body standards and norms. And did you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I, you know, t- talk to them about all the different methods and stuff. And did your parents do that? To you? Oh God, no, 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 no. How I knew that I'd got pubes is I came downstairs to do. I'd been in the bath, and I came downstairs to dry myself in front of the fire. And as I walked into the room, my mum went, "Oh, is that a pube? Is that a pube, Katie?" And I wrapped my towel around me and went, "Look, everyone, Bergerac's on. Don't look at me." 
Um, and that was the moment that I realised that I had a problem. Immediately, right. suddenly, my body was being commented on, which is, you know, that's just magnified across society. So, first of all, pubes are a problem. You've got to deal with it. It'll cost you, and it's, it's like paying a tax or a VAT on having a vagina. It's something you now have to maintain. You have to, pubes. Yeah, you have to plan when you're going to do things. Because it grows back, it'll become very itchy. So if you, you're going to, for instance, if you were going on a date next week where you thought you might have sex, about four days before, you'd have to like, get it waxed because you have to wait for the terrible disfiguring rash to die down. And then if you were going to apply fake tan, you'd be sort of Do you do any of this? Oh, Christ, no. Not at all? No, bloody hell, no. It looks like Grizzly Adams down there. No, right. I'm married. I'm at no, the Gra- game. Grace is when her thing. She has one where she's like got a big beard. Well, this is, I mean, in some areas it is now kind of, you know, it's sheep. Which I'm, I don't think is her, but it's quite upsetting for a father to watch that. I think it's like, what, is it an actual beard? Is it like a strap on Merkin kind of thing? Or, yeah. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not real. Like a kind of sporum. Yeah. A comedy sporum. Big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big bush. Yeah. Yes, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You like that? Yeah, and have the power, like kind of, you know, anything that saves you time and money right. allows you to spend more time gaining money and power and intelligence and friendships and actually living But if you've got so many young women who like what you say and like the feminist thing, why, why are they probably, most of them, doing this? Well, because I'm one tiny middle-aged woman writing funny books about these things compared to every single image they see every day and every single conversation they have. Mm. And that's why I believe in the word feminism when people go, oh, I don't believe in feminism, I just, I just believe in equality, you know, I'm into equalism, uh, which isn't even a word. Uh, and you're like, no, you need to talk about feminism, you need to talk about basically a gang and a structure that talks about changing things, that will talk yeah. about changing legislation, that has a history, that you know, has a framework in which we can analyse things. The, one of my friends talks about it as having your feminist glasses on, when you first start putting your spectacles on and looking at through your feminist spectacles yeah. and seeing what's actually going on in the world. Yeah. You tend to take them off after five seconds and go, it burns! <laughs> It burns and my life looks unpleasant. But, you know, Grace calls me a patriarchal feminist. Do you think that's a bad thing or a good thing? Uh, what does she mean by that, do you think? She thinks I'm, theoretically, I am a feminist and yeah. I totally do believe in women being equal to men, but that I am still all, I still am quite patriarchal. Well, for instance, the, well, what's your breakdown in the house? Do you do like a no, of housework? No. Okay, no. so unpaid labour in the house is a woman's job? No, no, I would do it. Um, but I don't. And do, you, do do the fairies and the pixies do that? You, you've got a very well trained dog that does that in order to say The dog yeah. just died. Don't upset oh, me. I'm sorry. You just really upset me. Sorry. <laughs> if you're going to throw a dead dog on the table when I'm trying to talk about feminism, we're not going to get much further. So, but is it. Do, do you think men, even kind of non patriarchal, part non patriarchal <laughs> male feminists, do you think it's possible for a man fully to understand? feminism and what it needs to be you know what even as a woman who's been writing about it for 10 years i don't still completely understand it because it's so huge it's the totality of all the of all of human history has generally been built by men and it takes a really really long time to try and stand back from that and kind of go hang on we think this is normal but this is kind of really only normal for one gender what would we have done if women had built this from the very beginning if they'd Mm. had to say Um, so where do you think we are on the kind of do you feel it's going forwards or backwards? That thing the other day, the I mean, I'd, ne- I'd never even heard the word incel. Incels, yeah, I was tweeting about this yesterday. I mean, I didn't. So what is it? Involuntary, involuntary, involuntary celibate. celibate. Yeah. Right. So that is a new word. Mm-hmm. Last week, last year we had post truth. Now we've got incel. Yeah, yeah. That for blokes to go around thinking that they can wipe out women or gang rape women because women don't want to have sex with them. Yeah. That feels to me like a very, very, very backward step. Well, the thing is as well, it's not just women, it's men as well. They want to kill men who are having sex. Like, oh, I mean, yeah, like, the ch- what are they called? Chavs? Chads. Yeah, chads. Yeah, men who have sex are called chads. Yeah, but when you have sex are called Stacey. Because this is the thing about feminism, like when I kind of, you know, the piece that I uh, wrote last year uh, about feminism as a primer for men, and one of the things that I said was that the thing about feminism is it's good for both men and women. Like, kind of, you know, it's about all the gender bullshit. So we yeah. get raped, we don't get paid as much, we get judged by our appearance. You don't get custody of your kids and you tend to commit suicide. Like, kind of, these are all gender take problems. So the whole idea... Take your own life. Sorry, take your, sorry, take your own life. Yeah, I'm, I'm, correcting you, I'm correcting you PC mental health language. Okay, sorry. Uh, you know, you end up tend, tending to take your own lives. Um, and that's gender bullshit on both sides. The whole idea about equality is you talk about both these things. So when you're talking about incels, you know, this is, you know, I saw a lot of men kind of defending it on the basis that they've done this because feminism has driven them into this corner right. and you know it's not feminism that's driven you to this corner it's inequality it's this idea of to be a man to prove your masculinity you have to be having sex with a woman you can only see yourself through a woman's eyes mm. a woman needs to be the reflective service in which you see your own value that is that is how you judge yourself but how, is, so, how, how, how is it not is it not really just about kind of old-fashioned dominance men wanting to dominate 
Yeah. But this is, but this would be, you know, the, the, you know. Hopefully, we'll get to a point where we can phrase this argument properly. Because being the dominant sex, being the winning sex, being the sex that's in charge, is exhausting. You know, you've been stuck in one mode. There was those people, with one plot those people, for ten thousand. That years. is what they. That is what they. They feel inadequate. They feel that they. Yeah, can't totally. Get on top of women, literally and figuratively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is why I don't understand. So then they like, want to kill them and kill the ones who do. Well, yeah, because they, because they're still in that you know they're still you know the general set that we have that men have to win, men have to sexually oh, dominate. Okay. What I'm saying is, women have spent you know since since the sort of you know suffrage and the feminism has sort of really picked up speed, we've spent nearly a hundred years talking about all the ways that women can change and new things that can be. Women have changed extraordinarily in the last hundred years. Women's lives and aspirations, the way they think, the way they analyze things, the things they create and do, and the capabilities they have have changed quantumly in a hundred yeah. years. In that time, our discussion about what men can be has been absolutely minuscule. There's mm. no such thing as, as a male feminism that is progressive and goes, okay, well, what if women have turned into all these incredible things, what can you do now? It frees you up. Mm. This is an amazing creative endeavour now. Like, what do you want to be? What's the stuff that's screwing you up? What's the stuff that your dads gave you that just, just ate you up inside or you're a teenager that you spend the rest of your life trying to get over? Mm. You know, what are the things in parenting you feel like you're not getting? Where the, what are the things that make you feel unhappy? Mm. That's, that's how we invented feminism. We all sat around. But do you, think men, do, you think the, do you think men should be doing something like that? Yeah. But the thing is that like, when you're a feminist... You write books about kind of all the ways that uh, women can change their lives and amazing possibilities that we could have and you know, this brilliant career. I believe feminism is more of a creative act than a, than a political act. It's about inventing futures for ourselves and inventing new kind of role models and what we should be. And then you always get asked a question where people go, well, what about men? What would be kind of, you know, what would be the advice for men? It's like, I don't know. I, 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 I can't, I'm doing women. Like, yeah. I, if feminism's going to do women. But is that because, but maybe if men have, if it's true that men have kind of ruled the world, mm -hmm. Then maybe I can fact check that for you. But yeah, that no, I'm, 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 yeah, I'll give you that one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Queen Victoria. It's hereditary. Yeah, but she was the most powerful person in the world at the time, probably. By, Probs. Anyway, that's... by spermy accidents. So, and I've had so, many spermy accidents. Right, so time, men have ruled the world. Men have ruled the world. Yes. So fe feminism is about women feeling that they've they've been held back and they want to get go forward. Yes. So men are in a, I guess, in a defensive posture. Yes. And you're saying break out of that by doing something new and different. Because the presumption is that where we're going to have this sex war is on this bit of territory, which is all, the, this is this is society, this is everything that we have, this is all the money, this is all the ideas, this is all the space you get to communicate, and it's all got to happen here. And for us to gain anything, you've got to retreat. And what I'm saying is, create something new. We have mm. infinite space now. Like, you, you, you don't need, I don't need to destroy any aspect of the patriarchy as far as I'm concerned. I just don't need to go and create something how different you somewhere the, else. How do, you find, how do you define the patriarchy? Oh, oh, it's not just about housework. Do you want to just it? show you a picture of my dad? Hang on. Um, uh, right. um, how do I find By the way, is you, it is, you know in the novel, yes. How to Be Famous, yes. right, we'll come on to fame, but how do you ever... See, is it totally ironic, that thing at the start where you say, this isn't me and it isn't based on me and it isn't and it all, you know, blah, 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 that stuff you say. Well, what I always say is... It's you, totally you. Well, if you look at the way that Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote Little House on the Prairie, she was definitely a pioneer girl going across America in that wagon and doing some survival stuff. And in the same way, the character in my book is definitely a fat, working-class teenage girl who's obsessed with music who wants to get laid and, and hustle some rent. Um, but if, if you read about the writing of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, some of the bears that she shot... Uh, and you know, and some of the sort of the huts that she built, uh, they were experiences that she had taken from other people and right. made it into okay. a novel. So, so similarly, some of the penises that the character experiences in my book were penises that friends or family members experienced that borrowed I the penis. borrowed the penis. Yeah, borrowed the penis. And were very neighbourly. So it's the, the working so classes were very fictional, tightly knit. We will knock cave. on a door and just borrow a, borrow a penis. Right. Yeah. Okay. But it's hard not to read it and think it is you. Yeah. Does that um, matter? No, I don't think so. And it's definitely your dad. Uh, and, and, you, and, and the gay boy is definitely your sister. <laughs> I mean, that's all a bit weird. Yeah, she did basically say, you can't write another book that I'm in. And so I was just like, I'll just have to make it into a gay boy instead. Right, but it is before the log goes to work. It's effectively. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, you can, from the fact that she's she's an angry introvert. Who said and there's even a bit, there's book. even a bit where, what's his name? The, the, the John. Uh, the rock star John Kyde. He's yes. si doing a signing. Yes. And I read an interview, a profile that somebody done where they'd seen you at a book signing. Yeah. It's you again. 
As you see, I'm not just the fat, no, sexy you're not, you're, girl. You're, you're I'm also everybody. the I'm also the working class rock star. But I mean, you talk to any writer, and that's what you do. I mean, of course, you are just hiding off all your own experiences. But the thing is about real life experiences; they tend to be quite unsatisfactory and not work out within a plot. So you know, you always this is what James Harriet always said about his books. You know, you start with a grain of truth, and then you start going, and it would have been more fun if this had happened next. And which what's important to you with with, with the with the, a novel like that? Is is it important that you're entertaining and funny, or is it important that it's part of the bigger feminist picture? Both equally. I think, uh, I mean, you know, there are people who write seriously about feminism and that's that's absolutely what they should do. We need every single word of it. But I believe that if I'm going to kind of secretly be preaching at you, I also need to be swapping you some juicy stories yeah, yeah, and yeah. some fun and some lols. Like, you know, I kind of, that's why I think so many young women and people, you know, the, the amount of people that come up to me and say, I didn't realise I was a feminist till you read your stuff. Right. It's like, How, they come the for most, the lols. They stay the most, the most, who's the most feminist man? You know. My husband. Oh, get off. No, seriously, he taught me about feminism. When he was, he worked, he's a journalist as well, when he worked for Time Out, it was the start of the Brazilians phase. Going back to pubes again now. Yeah. Everything comes back to pubes. Everything. It's, it's the Ouroboros of my conversation. And uh, he wrote a column, it was the start of the Brazilian waxing phase, and he wrote a column about just how just brilliant he thought bushes were and how ridiculous it was to be doing this and painful. And well, that's him thinking what he as a man likes. He's not thinking about you as a woman. No, it was definitely about. It was both of those. Was it? <laughs> I can assure you. Yeah, it was a. It was a beautiful ode to my to my foof. Oh. Uh, but but don't do I spell that? F W O F. F W O F. And listen, how um, does has he? Ne- have you never written anything? And he's gone. Oh, for fuck's sake! Did you have to write that? Oh God, no. Well, I like, very carefully keep away from his stuff. You, you say that, story. but yeah. No, you say that, but in the novels, that's. Sorry, if I, if if, if every all his characters are you, then that's yes. him. No, all Does the he not think that? All the characters are pretty much me. No, it's it's fine. I'm I am I am I'm a one woman <laughs> cast of millions uh, in the books. That's usually my experience. No, he's he's fine with everything. It, fine, fine with everything. Yeah. Fine with all the wanking. God, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why would a man what writing about wanking or the actual? Wanking? I just think they're constantly going on about it. Well, there's a reason for that, other than the fact that I find it very funny and also a really great way to let off steam at the end of the day. And it's if, but is it better to let off steam with him? And, Oh, did you do both? You, know, you, right. you keep the whole thing going. But I think it's really important to talk about masturbation to make it funny and accessible and exciting. Uh, because teenage girls just don't do it. If you read the stats on kind of like how frequently teenage girls, you know, give themselves sexual pleasure, it's it's absolutely minuscule. It's under thirty well, percent. But how how are these and again, in a port- done? Well, I, well, I mean, you don't. I get girls again coming up to me going, "I I never tried it till I till I read about really? it in your books." Yeah, that's how I learned about it. I was reading Jilly Cooper books. That's why I want to pass the wang. Jilly on. Cooper. I love Jilly Cooper. So it goes Jilly Cooper, Julie Burch, or you? Is that the kind of? I guess so. Yeah. The feminist cultural track. Yeah, yeah. We pass that wang on from generation to generation, like some kind of Olympic torch. So who's they could be great? My daughter could be next. Yeah, if she wants, she won't need any tips. I hope, but. Um, but yeah, it's really important for girls. I mean, it's an amazing hobby. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't make you fat. You can do it in under a minute. It really chills you out. And it means that you know about yourself. Because sex, particularly teenage girls, if you're watching pornography, you think sex is something that is done on you. Yeah, under a minute. Oh, I like him. But I mean, we used to have ranking races when I was younger. So I've kind of, you know... I've what, in the family the or best. in... Just with friends, you know, just sort of on the phone when you're bored. Uh, wanking competitions on the phone? Yeah, just, to see, be, just to, to see who could be fastest. So it was before the internet. I mean, I wouldn't bother now. I've got but could you, could, you could, how could you you'd fake it though, couldn't you? That would be beside the point. Right, okay. If you fake saying, it, yeah, it, to fake it is to lose. Even when you win, you lose in that scenario. Okay, like, kind of, okay. Um, so... But it's important girls know that something, you know, the whole the whole narrative, which is why I've worked some of the scenes that I wrote in the thing, like, she deflowers a boy. Because mm. I've read a million scenes about teenage girls losing their virginity to older men who show them a thing or two. Yeah. And for a teenage girl to lose her virginity is usually the worst shag she'll ever have in her life. You know, it's going to be very painful, it's very scary, you don't know what you're doing. And you are at a disadvantage because the person who you're having sex with knows you don't know anything. I don't like to be in a position where someone knows that I'm ignorant. Like, that's that's not my sexy time. And But I've never read about a teenage girl taking someone else's virginity. And then Why did it take so it. long in the novel yeah. to, for you... <laughs> in the diary. For yeah. you yes. to get off with... John Kind. Yeah. That's deliberate. The, the, the books were conceived as a trilogy. So this is the, In real life, you'd have, you'd have done that a lot quicker, wouldn't you? Let me think... Back to my past. Would you were I nineteen. Done it a lot quicker. You were nineteen. Yeah, I. Pr- and all that sort of sleep, you know, hanging out together and being on beds together in separate rooms in hotels. You wouldn't have done that, would you? Did I? 
Well, no, the, the, me and my husband were friends for a couple of years before we finally got together. We ran away on holiday, so I guess it's kind of more based on that. Oh, um, okay. But I wanted to leave the good sex till the very end. I think it was very important to document the reality of the fact that the first couple of shags you have as a teenage girl are probably going to be, at the time, terrible, but later, really brilliant dinner party anecdotes. And if you sit around with a load of women and sort of and see what them, you know, what is making them cry with laughter, it's usually descriptions of the first four or five times they had sex. Right. So it felt very necessary for the structure of it for it to take. See, this feels like a world I'm excluded from. Yeah, soz. So, so you know, we're 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 uh, we we poor men are just sort of. Well, there is a way that you can access that knowledge, and it's called How to Be Famous. It's by Ebri, and it's fourteen ninety nine, <laughs> and it's it's nearly three hundred. I read it. I read it in a day. Stuff. I read it in a day. It's three hundred and. Mine, oh, is it? Okay. Something like that, yeah. <gasps> You've just mansplained my own book to me, thanks. It was oh, <laughs> mansplained. That's not allowed, is it? That's not allowed, is it? Anyway, I did enjoy it. You made me laugh quite a lot. Oh, good. That's yeah. what I like to do. Yeah. Um, but, it was di- but, but I did see you in it all the time. Yes. And so, and, and, and based on that, mm. and based on reading some of the stuff you've written and interviews you've done and stuff, I mean, it is weird to sit down and feel that I... I feel a sense of entitlement yes. to be able to ask you whether you're wearing underwear. No, I gave up on pants a very long time ago. Really? They're an unnecessary layer. If you're wearing tights, you just don't need pants. Really? Why? Why would you keep lining up? To me, it just seems like I'm unnecessary. I'm just I'm too busy in the morning to put something on my bum twice. If I've got tights on, my bum is covered. I'm out the door. And have you ever said? Because this again, I can't remember this interview or in the book. Yeah. Have you ever said to your daughters, "Go and have a wank." I, I did say that a couple of weeks ago. Jokingly, obviously. A couple of weeks ago? Yes. Uh, it went down quite badly. Uh, right. She screamed, that's really inappropriate at me. Uh, See, they might think a lot that you do is inappropriate. Oh, God, yeah. No, they constantly tell me that what I do is inappropriate. But you, and are you sure they haven't read your books? No, they really haven't. I know this because when one of my brothers came to babysit when we went to Glastonbury, apparently they all sat around and played poker with the kids. I've heard this. You've yeah. told this one before. Yeah, exactly. And, right, um, well, there must be another story. They, they, they must. When was the last time you said to them, have you ever read one, any of my books? Uh, on Easter, I did an Easter egg hunt and I hid the clues all over the house. And one of the clues I hid in my book and they did not know where that book was. And in the end, I had to tell them in order for them to be able to find it. Right. And the book was in her room on her shelf. But they'll definitely... I keep putting it in there. She's not reading it. I mean, that is, that, is, that is safe. I can put my PIN number and my bank account details in my book. In the last, the last book, one book exactly that I wrote... Is that you think might be embarrassed? Do, do you think that might just because they might be embarrassed? Uh, do you think they would be embarrassed? I don't know. I mean, they're just very, they're very funny, open-minded kids. Like, so I don't think so. I just think it's that age. You just don't really want to know that much about your parents. I'm sure at some later point they will. But like at this point now, they need to define themselves. And you don't want to be reading about your mum's teenage years when you are trying to make yourself as a teenage girl. Right. I mean, that is so that thing about you talked about how you know most kids today will will, as far as they have any sex education, it's going to come through watching pornography. Yes. Right. Where should it be coming from? How to be famous, Ebri fourteen ninety nine. Oh, for God's sake, you can't just plug the books. <laughs> It's a joke. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's because where I, that's where I got my sex education. And it was all books that were written by women. And they were all sort of light oh, fiction that was okay. funny. And that, that, that's your sexual imagination. You're in a scenario. You're having it described. Mm. And, it, you know, and they're written by women. So it's from a female point of view. Whereas if you're watching pornography, which is an industry, and there is a kind of mono shag that you have mm. in all pornography. It follows the same pattern every time. A friend of mine, Laura Bates, who runs the Everyday Sexism mm. Project, was saying that when she went into a school, she was turned aside by a mum who said her 15-year-old boy had come to her and said that he had tried to lose his virginity with his long-term girlfriend the night before. And she had started crying because he had started to strangle her. Mm. So he was strangling her. And she went, please don't do this. I don't like it. And he went, oh, my God, I thought that was what women like. I don't like it either. And he started crying. And this is the first time these, you know, these teenagers mm. are having sex because that is what... I mean, it's, I find it astonishing that that is a very common trope in pornography. Mm. Strangulation, mm. fingers down throat, hair pulling, you know, slapping the ass. Like, if my clitoris is on my ass, I'll give you the fucking money myself. But I've got nothing out of this. And the idea that, like, teenage girls are watching this, the first moment they're starting to kind of, you know, you're starting to get that kind of warm honey buzz. So what should, parents, what, 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 what should parents be doing with this battlefield, this landscape? Well, we need to be, I mean, well, I mean, what I'm doing is writing pornography. It won't be able to help my children, but I'm hoping it might be able to help some others. But, you know, cheerful, lovely, fun pornography. But, you know, we... we, well, do, we do, 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 do you describe it as pornography? Uh, is, writing, is any writing about sex pornography? 
that is the quickest way to write about, isn't it? Just in the same way that writing about food you would call food writing or cookery. Like, I don't know if it's the, the quickest thing. I mean, you know, I intend to write it as funny and beautifully as possible, but I, I have also written it hoping that, you know, there'll be a couple of teenage girls who'll come up to me over the, over the years and just go, I had my first wank after I read that, or that was what I had in my head when I was having sex with my boyfriend. Uh, you know, you've made... Because the, the brain is such a malleable thing, especially when you're a teenage girl, and I want to put my lovely sex in their head rather than the horrible... Because the, the stuff you see when you're a teenager stays with you for the rest of your life. You know, it goes into a part of your subconscious sexually that you can't ever really access. That's just, that's your button that's going to get pressed. Right. And I just want to make sure that I'm putting some nice stuff in there to just try and combat the all the other stuff that they'll be shown on a phone by some horrible boy on the back of a bus. Mm. Um, so, mm. so, yeah, we just need to make, again, like, I think it would take, I don't even know how you would, it would take too much stuff, you'd get shouted at for kind of, you know, crushing freedom of speech and stuff. So I don't want to dismantle the pornography industry. It can, everyone can carry on as they are. I just need to think we need to start making alternatives. We need to start making, you know, we need to start showing great sex in films. We need to start writing books where we write about sex. And most people are too scared to write about sex in books. You know, I sat there going, oh God, I'm going to write seven pages of really explicit stuff now. Oh, well, that's my duty. Yeah. But what about, so, yeah, I think it's tricky this. I don't know how you do it. I think the, because uh, it is now also so kind of all pervasive. Yes. Um, is there not a danger that if you just say, right, we keep all this stuff that's going and then we do loads more and we hope that young people will sort of lean towards that. Yeah. So you're just kind of extending this, as what you rightly say, is a kind of massive global industry. But just stuff that's completely different. Like, kind of making, there's, a, there's, a, in it, there's a woman uh, called Cindy Gallup who has an organisation called Make Love Not War. Yeah. And she is a dedicated feminist and her whole thing is that she's, she gets people to make pornography that is people who like each other people actually want to have sex with each other and they film themselves having sex a you have to pay for it because you will have to pay for it because it costs money to do this so that, that's a different sort of operation but b you know this is what i wrote about in how to be a woman i find it crazy that i can access any kind of perversity in the world apart from seeing two people who actually want to get at it getting at it and that's yeah that's because the two people when they're getting at it the, do they really want to be thinking about, you know, well, we'll film this and we'll put it out on the internet and let people see it? Yeah, but I mean, the, the thing is now, I mean, maybe not 20 years ago, but now people film themselves doing literally everything. Like, kind of, you know, we are, you know, we're a fast generation. As in how to be famous. Well, yeah, exactly. Ebury, 1499, uh, yes, June, uh, June. Um, uh, so, yes, so that people are doing that now. So, I mean, the, there are alternatives. There's always alternatives. It's just finding ways to amplify them. But, I mean, my, my thing is always... You know, and it, it, with all my politics and all my feminism and all these things, it's like it takes too long to dismantle something. It takes too long to argue against something. Mm. It's always better to create something else. Okay, okay. So, um, now fa about fame then. Do you, yes. If, if the Queen and, sadly, Trump and the Beatles yes. are kind of... 100% famous. They're 100% yeah. are they? Or they're, they're all 100% yeah, famous, yeah, yeah. right? So we're, 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 who else is 100% famous? Oh God! Uh, I'll promise the Kardashians. Beyonce. No, no way. To you, they're not. Well, they're, therefore, it's not one hundred percent. Therefore, it's not one hundred percent. Okay, fair enough. I mean, are the Kardashians known by every single person on the planet? No, just everyone I know. No, okay, oh, all right then. You, yeah. No, I know them, but I don't know anything about them because I don't want to know. Okay, they're ninety-nine percent famous. That's what we've got there. Okay, I mean, they, really? are, they are pretty famous. Seriously, like, yeah. 99% famous. I have to write a celebrity gossip column every week and I can tell you that a good 40% of every single piece of celebrity gossip in the world is about either the Kardashians or Kim Kardashian's husband, Kanye West. But why does... Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right. Sorry. So... You don't need to get, keep out of the game. It's, okay, you know, it's, okay, okay. it's too late for you to catch up now. It's like Game of Thrones. So much has happened in the lives of Kardashians <laughs> that if you came in now, you'd never catch up. Okay. Well, I'm glad I missed it. You don't so... even know what Kylie's old face looked like. Just leave it. No, I'm, really, I, I'm glad I don't know. <laughs> but so where are you on the, on the 100? Mm. I think it's around about 15 to 16% in certain areas. Right. In, That's a, quite good. in a library or a politically left leaning area such as Islington. Uh, in a place where there are more homosexuals or lesbians than there would be in the normal society, in a place where there are girls who would wear black eyeliner um, and sensible shoes, um, at a Lady Gaga gig, uh, and in a bookshop. Those right. would be the places that I would be 17% famous. It's gone up in a minute. Uh, it's gone that, up. That was 17% famous there. Those, those are my hotspots. That's, my, that's, okay, my, that's, okay. my, that's my heartland territory. Everywhere else out in the world, probably, I don't know. I mean, very little, really. And what, do you... do which? It's interesting how... In a lot of the interviews I read, and actually touches of this in the novel. Uh, <laughs> Do you think you can make your eyebrows go any higher when you say novel? <laughs> They've gone up. By right, there's touches. Times. There's yeah. touches yeah. of you seem to equate 
fame, you, you see fame and success as being you you link them very very closely. Yes, and creativity. I think they're yeah. sort of like in the. In but the there world are a lot of famous people. Yes. Who don't seem to me to be that successful at stuff. Whereas, the, and there are a lot of successful people who are not very famous. That's you, true. So, do, which of the two do you do you see them going together, or do you do you see yourself as successful or famous? Oh, well, I'm I'm very successful in that I don't think there's many writers left in this country now, sadly, because of the industry that uh, that can earn a wage, and I managed to do that. So, I'm definitely successful. Um, but famous, I mean, I've, I've really deliberately tried to avoid being famous. Like mm. when How to Be a Woman came out, there was like a year long period where I would be mentioned in The Guardian or The Observer every week. I was being asked, I'm like, have I got news for you and question time and, you know, do go to the red carpet. Do you want to come to dinner with Meryl Streep? Do you want to come and write the, you know, sleeve notes for the, I shouldn't say who it was, but there was, there was a lot of things, you know, would Lady, you know, Lady Gaga wants to come to your house? Um, and I just said no to all of them. Yeah, I wouldn't recognise her, but I've heard of her. She's she's popular with the young people. Actually, she's not anymore. It's it's, it's been and gone now, but anyway. Really? It's too late for you to catch up. But the Kardashians have endured? Yeah, Kardashians endure. What will be left after a nuclear explosion will be the Kardashians and cockroaches. They and are the, the two and, unbreakable... And Trump, and Trump and the Queen. I think, not having I think a Trump visit. will flake quite quickly. <laughs> I don't, I, it doesn't strike me as a survivor. What it, do you think of modern celebrity? Well, it's interesting. The, one of the reasons why I set the book in the 90s is that in the 90s, you still were generally famous for doing something. So mm. creativity and fame were very interlinked. Mm. Um, and in, with the invention of reality TV, so, and then what happened, um, it was still in time where you could do like phone hacking and stuff. So there was lots of celebrity gossip. So the business of being a famous creative person, say, I don't know, you're Chris Martin from Coldplay or Bono, and you want to just write music and stuff. You he's, have a, he's, in, he's in the role. Oh, really? Bono, the talk. The Bono Talk. Oh, the Bono talk. talk. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, which apparently, I can't remember which version I wrote in the end, but I'd heard about the Bono Talk. But we'll come back to that later. Anyway, because I'm on a riff. So, fame and creativity. And if you want to be creative and write songs, then you have to pay the fame tax. People will hack your phones and talk about you in newspapers and you'll have to go and do red carpet, you'll have to be styled and all this kind of bullshit. And then what happened in the uh, the beginning of the of the noughties that was that we invented reality TV and it separated the two out. Yeah. Famous people who didn't want to do the fame stuff anymore and do interviews where they talked about you know what they eat and be sort of you know, do red carpet stuff and be styled and talk about you know going free holidays for OK magazine. They invented a whole you know milieu of famous people who just did the fame stuff. People yeah. who'd been on Celebrity Big Brother, you know, no, on yeah. Big Brother and you know all these reality TV shows. They were there just for the fame. And right. I thought that was one of the most sensible inventions that we've had in the to last few years. There. Just people who want to, people who want to just, you know, if they came on stage at Wembley, yeah, they'd be like, I've always wanted to play Wembley, I've always wanted to play Wembley, it's been my dream, my dream, my dream. And then they get on stage at Wembley and then they just wave at the audience and that's all they wanted to do. They didn't want to sing anything, they didn't want to say anything. Most people who want to be famous, actually mm. what they would do when they got on stage would just go, hiya! Mm. And then just see all of Wembley wave back and then it's like, job done. And everyone's well, like, I was on, I was on um, uh, Sunday brunch recently. Yes. And there was a guy there from The Only Way is Essex. No, Chelsea, made in Chelsea. Yes, yeah, yeah. I love your blanking coverage. You've got, no, you know, when the rainbow pinwheel eyes what come on, a, come on an Apple Mac when it's crashing. Well, they're, they're reality. Is he in that bit that you just. They're reality TV, yeah. They're, they're just there. there. They do famous things. If you read all the gossip. Paul, Paul McCartney's over here. Paul McCartney's over there. Paul McCartney doesn't need to tell you what he's had for he's breakfast. He's in a different space. It, yeah, he can just simply get on with doing stuff. But these guys, if you read all the gossip magazines, it's like literally the same 50 people every week. What have you eaten? Where have you gone on holiday? Are you pregnant? Have you had a baby? What's it like bringing the baby? Well, what does it say about us that, well, I'm not interested in What does it say about so many people that they care? Because in day-to-day -day life, you have a lot of glancing interactions in which you need to talk about something vaguely neutral. So, for instance, you're in a hairdresser, you're in a lift, you're in a queue, and there's someone Football. there and stuff. I'm sorry, there's quite Politics. a few people who don't... Yeah, that's that will go down really, really well in a neutral environment where you've got to have a two minute conversation. You have it. You quickly have a two minute conversation about politics and it remains calm and neutral. The weather. We've done that. You a know. wedding you're going to go to. It's Kardashian. It's, it's, it's only way it's Essex. This is what you talk about. What's Kanye done on Twitter oh, today? This, no. this well, Kanye's on Twitter today saying Donald Trump's a great guy. I know. I know. Even I know that because it was, it was about Trump. Yeah, I know. I, th I think Kanye is very ill at the moment, and I, I think it's. Uh, I kind of hope everybody treats him with the respect that he needs because I think he's. I think he's very ill at the moment. Seriously. Yeah. And what about money? Do you like money? Yeah. Bitch got to pay rent. Yeah. That bit about um, when John goes to the cash boy yes. and he's got a million. Have you, is that is that a you moment? You no, are. no. I just thought how funny that would be. That no, that no, that happened to one of the Stone Roses apparently when the Stone Roses reformed. Manny so you've stolen Stone Roses. Well. Have you, you stolen any of their yes. penises? 
No, I've never had sex with anybody in the bed. No, this is yeah. have sex with them. Stole, <laughs> stole these used, penises. Used their penises. No, 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 I've not used these penises in any way at all. I simply stole this anecdote about cash points. Yeah, no, apparently he went to the cash point and just and did, it just said it had got, he got four million pounds in his account and I thought, oh, that's, that's a funny anecdote, I'll steal that. And the, um, we, we, we briefly mentioned Trump. Mm. Uh, we don't want to talk about him too much, but just give me a word. Oh, God. I mean, the dryness of his head constantly... Constantly distresses me. I just yeah. want to get. I just want to get some Moroccan oil and just kind of like just just. It's such a fire hazard. It's so fucking dry and tindery. I just want to kind of just put a silicon gel on it or something just to give right. it any kind of shine or luster. It, it, as a, as someone who enjoys hair, I find it distressing. Uh, Trump. Well, I think. I mean, what I feel that we see sort of happening in politics at the moment is just the very very last gasp of that kind of straight white kind of. I hate saying the word patriarchal. So I'm just saying patriarchal um, thing. And he's like the most extreme example of that. Oh, just had Obama. It's like, it's like the big, yeah. And this is, and this black. is, and this is quite cool. And this is the backlash to it. Like, I, I his wife and daughters. Is that, I know, God, don't you miss him? He was such an elegant song. <coughs> um, but this is like, this is the backlash to that. And this is mm. like, kind of, it's, it's like, you know, we're all so used to the structure of a computer game now, and this is like in the computer game, you sort of you see baddies of ascending awfulness, and then you have like the end of the end of game baddie, and that's what Trump is in terms of that kind of style of politics. Right. And so, you know, this this is the last big one. You have the last big blowout. Where do you think he is on the feminist radar and the feminist spectrum? Uh, I think if he if if a feminist radar picked him up, it would immediately explode. <laughs> that kind of, that he's, not, he's not a feminist. That equipment would malfunction straight away. I think that's fairly obvious. Yeah. Well, he, he's he he's he is psychological warfare. Like I, you, when you see when I look at politics again now, I, I see less politics and I, I see psychological problems. Like I, when when I look at Trump, that feels like that is that is psychological warfare. What's going on there? His whole thing about bringing chaos. No progress can be made. Sort of in the UK and in the US at the moment, no one is talking about the future at all. Yeah. Everything is about going. <coughs> Everything's about resetting to a certain time mm. that the leader of, of those parties thought was a golden age, which for most people was not. I certainly don't want go want to go back to any time that either Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn or Donald Trump thinks is a golden age because they were terrible times for working class women for starters. So, for my, for my, you know, you, my, for my minority interest. You, um, Jeremy wouldn't be happy that you lump him in there with Donald and Theresa. Because it, it's it's backwards looking stuff. Like kind of, it's all about resetting. It's all about undoing. And like mm. kind of like, there's there's no creativity in politics you, anymore. You, you, you were sort you were quite pro Corbyn at one point. I was initially. Yeah, I voted for him as, as leader, and and I was I was pro him. But like kind of, I've just seen what he's done, and particularly with the anti semitism stuff at the moment. It just doesn't seem very effective. And. You know, when people are talking, the problem is that with politics at the moment, there was all this talk of like starting a new centrist party and they're saying they're going to put 50 million pounds behind it. First of all, that's just nothing. You know, you'd spend that in a week. And secondly, there's nowhere for a centrist party to be at the moment in conversation. Because as soon as you announce the, you know, the, the idea of a centrist party, which I think people would actually like something that was kind of, you know, sort of, you know, just, just a bit calmer and in the centre, it would be ripped apart on social media by, by the left and the right. The algorithms that there was, there was a brilliant Tim Berners Lee piece where he was talking about when they when they invented the internet, the World Wide Web, they it was a new thing. So the first thing they had to do was go, well, how can we get people to use this? And so they looked at what algorithm they were going to use to try and get people to use it. And it was like, well, is the information that we prioritise the stuff that is most fact checked or the most useful or you know kind of most intriguing? And they decided to run the algorithm of the World Wide Web on whatever was most controversial. Mm. What people most disagreed about, because everybody will, you know, so you hear an argument's happening over there, you pile in, mm. and that's what's happened now. I did time hop on um, Twitter a couple of weeks ago, uh, from seven years ago, and it was me and everybody that I know who's involved in politics uh, are going, God, it's so boring. Everybody's in the centre. Everyone's saying the same thing. Nothing's happening. It's so boring. Mm. Now, boom! You know, we we've forgotten how absolutely different and unprecedented it is to be talking in the way that we are, to be so factualised, to be mm. so binary, to not be talking about the future at all in any mm. aspect. Mm. And that is all because a space has been cleared and a tone has been set on social media that has influenced everything. And well, it's not just on social media. I mean, it's, it's set by the nature of the Brexit campaign. Yeah. It's set by the nature of Trump's campaign. But this is that, that Steve Bannon quote that came from Britbart, which is that politics is downstream of culture. Like, kind of, it was, you know, it, it's just, you infect the culture. When you look at the internet, and this is, seems to be what the Russians looked at as well, it's like, mm. for the first time, the biggest migration that's ever happened in human history mm. isn't after the Second World War. It's not the sort of post-Syria fallout. It's people going to the internet. A third of the world's population went to the internet. This is the start of a global consciousness. For the first time ever, everybody is in one place. And so we were all just like hippies, just going, hey, it's great. We just post pictures of cats and avocados. And people with darker minds were just going, great, everyone's in one place. 
their defences are down, well, the, no one knows where the stuff's coming from, get the in voluntary there. voluntary celibates can come together. Totally. Like, kind of, you know, because the tone was set. Mm. You know, that's a space and a tone that's been set, and this is now how we talk and how we, we have political discourse. Are so, you still in the Labour Party? Uh, I am, yes. It's very difficult to resign, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> I tried a couple of times in peak. Um, but are you, are you close? Yeah, I don't think I'll be voting Labour in this election for the first time. Well, the locals? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because of the anti-Semitism, or is that... Is Semitism, that sort of just the kind of... Just the general... Yeah, just the general sort of sense of it's... I, I, I like, you know, I like inclusive, creative politics, mm. and that's not what I see in the Labour Party. So what would you vote? I don't know. I'm going to have to go off and research whether it's going to be Lib Dem or Green. I really don't know. I, I don't mm. think women's equality are, are, are finding anybody in the mm. in the case. I don't know. I'm going to have to research. It's going to be the saddest days of research I've done in my life. Mm. And what about Brexit? Oh well, obviously I love Brexit, so uh, that's really? fine. You yeah. Don't yeah. My badge. yeah. <laughs> I do want your I'll badge. I'll get your badge. I'll get your badge. You, I... can have, you can have my badge. Thank, thank you. Put, thank put you. on your leather jacket. Let, let's 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 centre it here, just a bit subliminal advertising for like, what my politics are. Um, <laughs> oh, where's, yeah, where's my phone? I'm looking to my phone off. <laughs> Get a this is that uh, got Brexit on my mind. Um, I don't think it'll happen. Really? Do you know what? The People's Vote logo yeah. goes really well with your yes, eyelashes. Oh, with right. your, uh, what do you call that stuff? Uh, eyeshadow. Eyeshadow. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. This is yeah. good. <laughs> See, politics can make you look very good. Um, it just seems not to be happening. Like It seems like a huge amount of paperwork that would need to be done in order for it to happen. It's just not happening. You know what I mean, though? Like, kind of every time we, we hear back from the EU, they're going, well, we're here, we're ready to Brexit, but no one from the UK is doing the Brexit. Like, kind of, it just seems not to be happening. So I'm, 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 I'm hoping it won't happen. And I'm also looking at places in the world that I'm, my husband is Greek, and so we're now getting... Is he proper Greek? Uh, his parents are first generation Greek. Right. So we're now looking at getting a Greek passport for him and my kids, just so that they can, you know, still have the option of being in the EU. And nearly everybody I know has got the get option to do that. Whatever it takes. I kind of, I just... And why do you feel it? Why do you, I mean, I listen, I'm obsessed about it, but yeah, so yeah. Why, do you, why do you feel it so much? Because all I can see is things that are being taken away from us, just like that, you know, you're part of this big drag. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, but you can see all the things that are wrong with the EU, you know, the way they treated Greece. I mean, obviously, we, we can have conversations about that for ages. Like, you know, and I, I understand the left wing argument against the EU, but I just feel that something is being taken away from me and my children, that we were part of this, you know, this massive coalition. They could travel freely, the access there, they could study where they wanted, they could travel where they wanted, they could live where they wanted, they could marry who they wanted. That's all being taken away from us. And just that right now, the idea that we would become more nationalistic and more tiny and have less connections, but like everything else, like what, what, what is the big growth in the world at the moment? It's tech, it's connectivity. So, you know, in every other aspect, younger people, in every other aspect where all the money is, is in connectivity, is in a global voice, and, you know, kind of like, you know, joining together. And then in this one thing, so many you, But you and I are both from uh, towns, Wolverhampton City. Wolverhampton, yeah. It uh, is now, yeah. Uh, further north, which were very, 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 very heavily pro leave. And um, we've come down here and have now got different views. Yeah, well, there were, there were two reasons why you can see that happened. First of all, because there was such a crush on resources and facilities. So, you know, the austerity measures meant that people felt that they would have to fight to get the things that they needed, that there was, you know, that they, this stuff was... But if you look at the stats, the places that most fear Brexit are the places that have the least immigration. So they're being told that these people might come and take resources from them. And because they're experiencing austerity and they're seeing that classroom numbers are getting bigger, they're finding what longer waiting times at the hospital, they're seeing... Diane, they think, oh my god, if more immigrants come in, then you know, I'm not going to be able right, to have these yeah. things. So, like, so yeah. it, you know, it was an obvious fear. That do you kind of do you understand that at the intellectual level? In what way? What? Well, do you, do you understand why they feel that? Well, yeah, because because you know, where are you getting your information from? Most people are getting it from Facebook. You know, they're reading a post that their aunts have written, just going, "Our library's just closed down, and 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 they're going to let in another, you know, two hundred thousand undocumented immigrants this week. Put two and two together. It seems very very simple. It's the mm. it's the story that has been told." But you know, but the, but, so you, but, you, but your your basic view. You mentioned Tim Berners Lee. Is your basic view about the way that the web, the web has developed that it's that it's more dark than than light now? I think it's become that way, but it's but it's very very embryonic. Like we have a global consciousness, and it is at the moment that of a child. We've, this is the first time we've done this, so we'll go through a toddler phase. I mean, we kind of think probably in our toddler phase now. The internet frequently gets very angry. He's the president. It's obs- well, exactly. It's you know, it's obsessed with its you know food. You show a picture of a cat, and it calms down again. But yeah, we'll have a big fight. We're in our kind of toddler consciousness at the moment. You know, hopefully we'll progress through all these things. We'll start to learn from our mistakes. You know, we'll, we'll put in these... But, you know, I'm very concerned that Mark Zuckerberg is basically in control of kind of the, the tone and the 
space and the conversation, the, you know, the, com the global conversation that we have, and he appears never to have read a book on ethics or moral relativity or philosophy. So it's sorry, literally, Bob. well, it's just he's got no idea of what it is that he's created. He's just created a business, mm -hmm. but everybody else sees it as where they live. This is where you think, this is where you have your life, and that's the difference between the people who use it and the people who created it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why there's a huge do you feel? Do you feel, do you, do you feel it's changed you? See, I think we think, I, I, I sometimes wonder that we, we may be exaggerating it, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, no, it's definitely changed me. I mean, it's educated me massively. You know, right. I've been able to talk to people that I would never have met before. I can have conversations, I can throw a conversation out. Onto Twitter. Like yesterday we were talking about incels, I'd only heard about incels yesterday, and so I just asked the question, okay, we've just learned about incels, involuntary celibate men who, because they can't get laid, kill people, mm. just to ask, ladies, what do you do when you're involuntarily celibate? And we just had a whole day, about 2,000 replies. What was people. the best reply? Amazing, there was a woman who'd gone and opened a school in, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, there was a woman who taught herself four different languages, I mean a lot of the answers were wanking and cheese. Um, but, uh, you know, sort of like, these are the dogs that I've got here, the two children that I had, uh, you know, um, I... You can't, I have, you can't be involuntarily celibate and have children, can you? No, she'd adopted children. Because she couldn't get a guy? Yeah. She was just like, you know, it was brilliant. Why, does, why don't those women meet up with these guys and well, be this, nice well, to each other? Well, this is exactly what I said. I was like, it seems to me that these incels need to have female friends and not to have shag. And just like actually talk to women, because the thing is, women are taught to amuse themselves. It's part of the female narrative. Like, this is again why I love writing novels and so I'm writing a film at the moment. We wrote a TV show. So it's about who's in control of the stories. Yeah. And time and time again, the story that women are told in films and in books and whatever is that when things are bad, you go away, you sort yourself out. Mm. You know, you amuse yourself. You kind of you gear up a bit and you come back and you become a better person. Men don't really have that narrative. You know, you get bitten by a radioactive spider and start ejaculating web and then you kill some guys, like kind of... Do you, do you, know, do you know my overriding thought talking to you? What? It's transcribing this. I know, I'm really sorry. Why do you speak so fast? I've got a great transcriber. Have you? Very contact with oh, well, I do. No, I like to do it myself because yeah. I can listen to it that way. No, send it away. I talk very fast because I come from a large family. Yeah, and so you have to, if We eat fast. Um, we talk fast. If you don't eat fast, someone will just go, you don't want that sausage then, and just eat it. Um, Unless I've got one big bone to put with you. <gasps> Is this about when I tweeted about five years ago about how attractive I found you? Did you? Yes. Oh, it's not that then. Okay, fine. Far away. Did you? Yeah, that's far away. That's okay. It's not that question. Is it being preserved by, for, for posterity? It's Twitter. Everything's there, isn't it? Oh. I've not scrubbed my history yet. I'm amazed that I didn't retweet it. <laughs> I think I tweeted it when I knew you'd be asleep, just so it was okay. other people knew, but okay. you would not see in okay. case it was embarrassing. No, it's not that. that. Okay, yes. It's why did you send your kids to Bible school? Well, it's uh, because there are no, we couldn't get them into any nearby state school. You should have given us a ring. We'd have found you one. What, ring you personally, Alistair Campbell, in well, 2010 and say I can't sort my kids out? Oh, but you can. The schools are a lot better than people. Schools in London are good. No, no, no. no. We, I want them. I want them to go to state are school. Good. There's a thing called the Crouch End Black Hole where there was a baby boom in 2001. You, you know the stuff. So there was a baby boom in 2001. That's when my eldest daughter was born. We could not get into any of our local state schools. So I've not bought her an educational advantage. I sent her to the hippiest school that I could. I was home educated. My preference would be to home educate them, apart from the fact that it means that they become well, well, just... horribly socially anxious. So we just sent them to And you'd be teaching them how to wank all the time. Uh, uh, hopefully, <laughs> every teenage girl just is self taught in that respect. But the other thing is, as well, that like, you can't be 100% socialist in you know in a world that's not 100% socialist. You know, I want to live a socialist life. Well, I think I, I do. do th I do think education socialists. is like the biggest. Private education is the biggest driver of class in this country. I think. Totally, but then if you go and see this hippie school, like I can guarantee you, they're not going to. They're not making amazing connections. They're okay. building tree houses. Okay. And I'm not going to give. Uh, we find that tweet and send it back to me so that I can show my daughter. Uh, I think you may need to Google it. You can simply use the internet and find it. <laughs> can you, can you, no, you can't. You can Google Twitter. Yeah, but you tweet about 500 times a day. You, if you put Cadden around as to Campbell, it'll come up pretty quickly. That's, really? It's fairly effective in that manner, yeah. Wow, okay. So you that, have you never used Google? Yeah, I use Google, yeah, all the time. I use Twitter all the time. Yeah, yeah. But not as often as you, I don't think. No. Do you still, are you still liking Twitter in the main? Yeah, I mean, it's changed. I mean, there was the great troll invasion of 20... When was it? 12? When all the women... Basically, what had been happening is, at the beginning of Twitter, in this country, women were in charge of it. It was all funny, brilliant, progressive, sort of lef lefty feminist women just pissing about. We'd do things like go... Well, like Katie Hopkins? No, no, she was not part of our lovely girl gang. And I'd do things like... Because we didn't know what social media was for at that time, so I'm going to take this off now. Um, so I'm I, taking it off. So I, so I'm just going to pop it there. Um, it's going to give me a spot otherwise. 
Um, so, uh, so I would do things like, hey, day trip to France. Let's all just get the ferry and fuck off to France and buy loads of wine and cheese. And everyone would go, yeah, I'm on the ferry. And like, suddenly you'd have like Maggie Philbin from Tomorrow's World go, I'm on the ferry, but I'm a bit drunk and I've fallen off. It was like kind of silly role oh, So when did it become like horrible and people started to I think it was to... the summer of 2012. It was the troll summer. Basically, there's a website called 4chan. Uh, 4chan. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's part of the Game Gate thing. And horrible. then there was a sudden, basically, feminism had become really big on Twitter. It was kind of, it was really changing things. All the women were talking to each other. We had everyday feminism. Caroline Caradio Perez doing the, 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 pan, the, uh, the banknote uh, campaign and me. And there was just a sudden, women were targeted that summer. Every woman I know had multiple rape and death threats constantly, 200 an hour. It was, it was a very deliberate attempt to shut us down. And lots of people left and lots of people had nervous breakdowns. It was, mm. And Twitter did nothing about it. And, and this, this was like on the 10 o'clock news. And it basically became an advertising campaign that said to every inadequate trolley fuckwit yeah, out there, here's your place. Mm. It was one of the most astonishing advertising campaigns have of you, time. Do you ever get... I mean, I, I, maybe my skin is too thick, but I just genuinely have never cared about anything that you said about me on social media. But do, does stuff ever get to you? Uh, I've learnt a lot from it. Like, kind of, you know, I, I've, I've learnt that, like, you know, a lot of the things that I wrote about, you know, because I've never really studied feminism and stuff, like, kind of, you know, that I write from a particularly white, working class, you know, cis, hetero angle. And I've had lots of people educate me, some of them angrily, some of them lovingly. Uh, so, you know, I feel like I've got a, be a better understanding of what I don't understand now. So it's been incredibly useful in that way. But, you know, generally, if someone's just abusing you, I just do the classic, your mum, and then block them. Um, because, uh, because see, I don't block. You see, it seems insulting to say your mum, but what you're actually doing is going, would you say this to your mum? Think about that. Yeah, but hold on a minute. Are you saying you are their mum? They, they get to think about that in the tangled Freudian nightmare of their terrible poisonous subconsciousness. But I just simply remind them that mums we're exist, human. we're all mums, Mother Earth, and then I block them. Um, yeah. But where's it all coming from that it's so horrible at the moment? I mean, there was a thing on the news last night about these these people whose job is to moderate the worst content on Facebook. Yeah, and they get, they get proper post-traumatic stress disorder. Like yeah, they kind of, like, it's really well, I've been horrible. sent it. I mean, you know, pictures of really horrifically mutilated bodies with my face on it. People say they're going to kill my kids. Um, or well, there's a it's a, you know it's a when resources become scarce, mm. yeah, you know, people become vicious and resources have become very scarce. Mm. You know, you know, I, I think that was a partially engineered situation that we don't need not be in, but this is the situation we're mm. in. You know, mm. we're going through a period of austerity that is seeing stuff cut to the bone and people mm. are scared, mm. and also people see that there's a time of massive change. Um, and also, you know, you talk to young people now, like I was sort of talking to some youngsters about Instagram and like this, you know, the pressure that you know, sort of like mental health stats are through the roof at the moment particularly for young people yeah. self-image self-confidence and lots of people have gone oh this is social media you've got to be perfect and it's not as simple as that it's the fact that they know it's going to be very hard to get employment in the future and you have to they're being sensible they're not just being kind of like oh it's a sexy bikini pic I'm, i want the likes and the lols yeah they're like i have to start a brand from the age of 14. they've had it absolutely drummed into them that this is a meritocracy in the worst possible way the you have to who's have massive the, meritocracy the but you only have to like is you know, it peer just, pressure drumming or is it a corporate no it's social drumming. it's like financial isn't it like kind of all the predictions are like they can see that they're going to earn less than the you know than their parents did they know they're in a time of economic decline they know they can't get in the housing ladder they know most industries are disappearing we don't know what ones will replace them yet people are constantly talking about robots taking over the earth yeah. I was a 14 year old when I was 14 it was all acid house and you could rent a house in Camden for 70 quid a week and it was just like part life it was mm. amazing do you take drugs today? Christ no I get scared. I have to ask people if they give me a painkiller if it's going to make me go wiggy. Right. I get very, very scared. I did, I did, I did my, I did my fair amount of drugs in the nineties. Um, I, I, at the time, I thought I was a marauding Viking, uh, but what I realised now is I was an incredible lightweight. And my response to taking any drugs was to lie down under a table and get in the way of people's feet for about four hours. What do you think of trees, May? Oh, I just, I, I, I mean. For a very long time, I thought David Cameron was the most embarrassing leader we'd ever had in this country, but I think Theresa May might, might, might just be winning now. I mean, the astonishing hubris of calling the Brexit vote uh, will probably always win out. Mm. But just... She knows, she, must, she, she knows now that Brexit is going to be terrible for this country. Yeah. And just the fact that she just seems to have just shut everything down and just be like, nope, just my job, just but, simply but, carry but, on. But, Have some balls. But Labour are not doing much on Brexit, are they? No. Is that why? Is that the other reason why you're getting a bit jumpy? Yeah, and Brexit. Yeah, because I just it just seems that if Brexit has just shut everything down. Like kind of yeah, our domestic policy, policy, our foreign policy, the creativity, the excitement, the energy, mm. the you know Brexit has just taken ninety eight percent of our resources. 
and our and our oxygen and our space and our energy. Is, is Everything that, is ground to a halt. I'm not saying he's the only factor, but is your boss at the times not a big quite a big factor in that group? God, you know what? I've been to the office twice in ten years, and the second time I went into the office, I was sitting in reception, getting really, really angry. They hadn't come down to collect me and take me upstairs. And I rang my 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 editor at the magazine and went, Nicola, Nicola, I've been in reception for ten minutes. Where are you? And she went, We've come down to get you. You're not there. And then we realised that I was in the old building, and that they had actually moved offices two years previously. So I'm, not, you know, I'm. I mean, you but, know, but, but it, you, the Times is better than the Sun, but it's a Brexit organisation. Like, what can I say? I mean, they took on a working class kind of, you know, pro LGBTQ sort of like, you know, semi Marxist, sweary, wanky, feminist. Well, at that time I was, right. you know, from a council estate in Wolverhampton who mm. was home educated, who had no contact. You were a prodigy, though. And gave me you a You were a prodigy. Doesn't matter. They, I sent them a fax with a column in it, and they went have a job, and yeah, they've no, always. That's, that's in the novel. Yeah, I know. That's in the novel. Uh, uh, you get the job. Don't waste a fact. Um, and they've employed me ever since. How many they, more novels? Write how, many more, how many more novels do you think you'll write by yourself? I. The thing is that I've had people go. Well, look, your, your, your sitcom, your TV series, was about a fat working class girl who's sexually obsessed. Uh, You're not that fat, by the way. So, you know, but you know, just you know, not you know. But my my days as a Victoria's Secret model are, are numbered. But no, I'm, but you're not fat. I look. No, I'm certainly not. Well, I used to be. But I you was, describe yourself as fat all the time. I don't describe myself as fat now, but I was then. I was a size twenty four at sixteen. So right. that kind of you know, I was packing mm-hmm. a lot of junk in the trunk. Mm-hmm. I simply had. I thought at that time that uh, calories would be down to how interesting a food was. <laughs> so a potato could only have one calorie in it because it's quite a bland food. Yeah. Uh, so I learned quite quickly. Uh, so where were we? Uh, oh yeah, uh, no, I can't remember. Yeah, I don't. Do you feel you plugged your book enough? Yeah, I don't know. You know, I could. Yeah, I've mentioned it. I've really not bothered. No, You're not bothered. I've already started writing the next one. I'm writing. Have you? Busy. How many? What's the next one? Uh, the next one is a sequel to How to Be a Woman called More Than a Woman. More than a woman. woman exactly. More than a woman, woman to me. Because I've learned a lot more about feminism and also every you know the book stopped. The last one stopped. Is it novel or that would be nonfiction? And then fiction is uh, a book called uh, Husband Material, which I've been told not to talk about the plot to, but I'm so unbelievably excited about it, I can scream. So, it's, it's called Husband Material. Yeah, and I'm writing those two concurrently, and we're doing a film of How to Build a Girl, which we start shooting in eight weeks, so I'm just I'm up to my tits in rewrites on that. You're so. not in that, though? I'll have a cameo in the background. Oh, lovely. I'll be some kind of busty barman like wench, Hitchcock. just Hitchcock. kind of like, yeah, big, except it's got never had a massive beehive and a fag and a kind of leopard skin dress kind of serving pints, which is Excellent. how I insist on being portrayed. That's good, that's good. Oh God, I, I mean, we can't really get that. into the, the fact that you prefer the word cunt to penis. Well, pe- I mean, if you say it penis, it's funnier. Uh, I, I like the power of cunt. Like, I know, it's just kind of... I mean, first of all, technically, it's the only word... What's your cunt's name at the moment? Because you, you say you give them... You give it, you give uh, well, I'm on, the, I'm on that thing uh, where it's the last film that you watched that you have to call it after. Oh. So my friend's is Carol, which I really like, and it definitely suits her. And then what was the last film I watched? Oh God, mine's The Godfather. <laughs> no, The Godfather Part 2. That must be what my vagina is called at the moment. Godfather? No, it's The Godfather Part Godfather. 2. Godfather. <laughs> Why have you only just seen The Godfather Part 2? Is that a, re- a rewatch? I never watched anything made by men until I was about 30. No. That, at, at the beginning, is a kind of non-deliberate policy. Uh, oh, that's that, just... is, that is over-the-top feminism, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, it is. Well, do you want to hear my explanation, or do you want to carry on explaining to me why it would be, no, g- g- have been better for me to have read Philip Roth when I was 12? <laughs> tell me. Because because I was home educated. Well, Shakespeare? Would you have read Shakespeare? No. Shakespeare. I was home educated. Shakespeare is even more prolific writer than you. I have to tell you. I preferred to watch Ghostbusters. Um, because that was made by men, but good men. They were my exceptions. Anyway, generally, obviously it wasn't a complete thing, but uh, being home educated, I chose the books that I wanted to read, and they were all, as I didn't realise at the time, by women. And it was usually stories about working class girls. It was like Jane Eyre, uh, the Anna Green Gables. Right. And when I meet women, one of the things they say to me is, I don't, un- but after a couple of drinks, they go, I genuinely don't understand why you're not completely self loathing and seem to have some kind of confidence and you're okay to talk about these things. And I've tried to work it out for years and I think it's that. I never read a male gaze on a woman. And when I started reading like the great white writers, kind of like in my sort of late 30s, you start reading Roth and Updike and Chandler. I mean, Chandler, that brilliant line where I was going, she was kind of dame that can make you kick in a stained glass window. Now that's a beautiful line. That's absolutely fucking gorgeous. It's funny, it's brilliant, it's vivid. But if I'd read that when I was 14, I would have gone, okay, that's what I'll need to be then. I will have to be the kind of dame that will make men kick in stained glass windows. Just the way that women are portrayed is not some... These men aren't sitting down and talking to women. You know, they're not friends with women. When Martin Amis and Christopher Hitchens both said, women aren't funny, 
It was like, you have never, you're not friendly to women, you're not interested in women. You've never sat down and talked to a woman. Yeah. You go to a pub, there's a group of men over here laughing and a group of women over here laughing. The women will be laughing 10 times harder because they're 10 times funnier because there's 10 times more bullshit to deal with in your life if you're a woman. They will be the ones going, you're gonna make me pee, stop, stop, stop. Men will be sitting there going, Nice, Simon. That was a good. That was a good joke, Simon. That was good. That was some strong humour. Yeah. <laughs> my humourometer is, is is tipping over. Mm -hmm.